Dear industry partners, media professionals, and distinguished panelists, my name is uh, Chang Chi Pei. I'm from the Singapore Tourism Board. Thank you for your presence and time this afternoon. I am delighted to be part of the Singapore Reimagine Global Conversations Forum series, and in particular, this edition taking place today at Dubai Expo 2020 in partnership with Intelligence Squared Limited. Reshaping the future of global travel at a time when tourism is at a critical crossroads will not be possible through a singular effort. This is why the Singapore Tourism Board has created Singapore Reimagined Global Conversations, a forum series that aims to provide a global platform for business leaders across the tourism industry and beyond to come together, exchange ideas, and trigger new conversations and collaborations to collectively reshape international travel. Singapore, despite being small in size, is big on ideas. We are also passionate about possibilities and are keen to share insights and learnings in the areas of experience, technology, and enhanced safety measures. As an innovative nation built on passion and resilience, we are committed to leading and charting a new path together with our local and global partners so that we can all emerge stronger from the pandemic. The first Global Conversations Forum on Reimagined Experiences took place in September 2021, shed some light on the heightened needs of travellers in the new COVID-19 world. Based on findings from a report shared by our data partner, WGSN, there is a rise in travellers known as the mindful explorer, those who are conscious of the environment and seek sustainable choices during their travel journey. As borders gradually reopen, the following questions remain. How can cities respond to these shifting travel needs and new consumer needs? And can they do so with urban design and technology? The Dubai edition of our Global Reimagine, Singapore Reimagine Global Conversations seeks to address these questions. Our panel of industry experts will touch on the new trends in urban design and technology while discussing exciting trends within the tourism industry. It is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, Sarah Khan, who has recently been appointed as Editor-in-Chief of Condinas Traveller Middle East. Sarah represents a new generation of modern travellers and will be bringing her contemporary and global perspective to the discussion. I will now pass over the time to Sarah Khan and the esteemed speakers. I wish you all a very fruitful and engaging session. Thank you and have a great afternoon here. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Thank you so much for that introduction, Mr. Chipe, and thank you all for being here. My name is Sarah Khan and I'm Editor-in-Chief of Condé Nast Traveler Middle East and I'd love to welcome you all to this special event organized by the Singapore Tourism Board in partnership with Intelligence Squared and the Singapore Reimagined Global Conversations. We're all here today because we're all, we all love travel and we're all invested in the future of travel. And until now, travel has had a lot to do with art, culture, food, architecture. These are the things that really drew people to cities when they were looking for their dream destinations. But the last two years have put all of us, even the most avowed globetrotters, into a period of stasis where we've all been forced to regroup and reflect on what travel means to us and also how we intend to travel more thoughtfully in the future. The next generation traveler craves meaningful trips. They're more eco-conscious and they want to visit cities that are clean, green, and serene, knowing that they are helping and partnering with helping the planet and not harming the planet. And after two years of social distancing, I think we all can agree that human interaction and things like live in-person events are more important than ever before because we are all craving those interpersonal connections. And we've also become much more mindful of how our movements and how our interactions actually impact those who live in the cities that we love to visit. So to join me in this conversation, I'm delighted to have three brilliant speakers coming on board um, and I would love to invite them to the stage to have this really exciting conversation. First, we have Dr. Barkatanisha Abu Bakr. 
who is founder of Elevated Consultancy and Training and co-founder of World Women Tourism. Dr. Nisha is a tourism consultant, practitioner, academic, and corporate trainer, and has more than 25 years of experience in the tourism, hospitality, and mice industry. Welcome, Dr. Nisha. Thank you so much for being here. And we also have joining us remotely today, Michael McGill, who is Managing Director at RSP Middle East and North Africa. Michael McGill has trained in the UK and prior to joining RSP, was employed in a number of high profile international architectural practices. Since then, he has led design teams to win numerous international architectural competitions. Welcome, Michael. And then finally, we have Xavier Anglada, who is Managing Director at Accenture, Innovation, Digital Transformation, Energy Transition. Xavier brings 25 years of combined management, consulting, and operational experience in the digital, fintech, high-tech, media, and telecommunications industries in Europe, Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. Xavier was also MD at Accenture, leading on strategy, strategy, technology, innovation, and experiences at Expo, right here, where we all are today. So we have a lot to learn from you about how things have changed here. He's also worked with many of the designers here to create these visitor journeys that we've all been experiencing. Welcome, Xavier. Thank you. So why are we here today having this conversation? I think we've all seen borders have been reopening slowly, um, and we're finally able to start dreaming up these new travel plans. And so the questions that we're asking and talking about today are actually much more practical now than theoretical. And with our panel, we want to explore how cities are sh uh, approaching these shifting travel trends and new consumer needs in urban design and technology. So just a little bit of an overview of what's gonna happen. Today's event will run for one hour. For the first 15 minutes, I'll invite our speakers to give their opening statements. And in the second half, we're hoping to have a really lively, engaged debate and conversation. We'd love to have you all join as well with your questions. We'd love to have everybody talking about this as we pave the way for the future. We would love to also continue the conversation on Twitter, so please tweet us or tweet about the event using the hashtags, hashtag IQ2 and hashtag STB. And so, now we're going to talk about what exactly it is that we mean by reimagine cities and can cities leverage urban design and technology to attract the next generation traveler. I think a lot of these conversations have been having, happening concurrently throughout the pandemic where we've been talking about the importance of urban design, the importance of technology, the importance of sustainable practices as we are understanding and navigating this post-pandemic world. And so now this conversation lets us bring these conversation points together under one umbrella to really talk about how these all interlate and inter interconnect and interrelate to each other. So around urban design, this is a fascinating time for urban design where you know, there's so many different ways that people have been approaching the, how to navigate this new world. In places like Europe, we've had to work with existing centuries old infrastructure in places like right here in the Middle East, things are much more dynamic and evolving and can change rapidly. And then Singapore is a unique place that's at the junction of old and new, where past meets the future at every corner. Sustainability, we've all been aspiring to be more mindful and thoughtful about how we practice our living and our travels and how our movements impact the environment and others around us. And then technology has been our most vital tool in battling the pandemic. I think we've all seen how important it's been for implementing new safety measures with less reduced touch points at airports, with AI solutions to really help us travel more safely and easy, easily. So with that in mind, who is the next generation traveler? I think we've all seen that the tra pandemic has created this new class of traveler that didn't really exist two years ago. We've all thought of global nomads as these free-spirited young travelers who just jet set around the world with freelance income as the, you know, moving from place to place as the spirit moves them. But with all this remote work that we've seen in the last two years, this has created a new, challenge, new opportunity that blurs the lines between holiday travel, business travel, and actual residency. And so this resulting hybrid traveler tends to be more thoughtful and deliberate in how they choose their destinations and cities that they're looking to because they look to their trips as more temporary relocations and not just holidays. And they're often more eco-conscious and look to their cities with an idea of what they're looking for for residents, not tourists. 
So this is a whole new world that we're emerging into, and I'm really excited to learn more about it through our fascinating panel. And so first, I'd love to invite Dr. Nisha to the stage for your opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and um, very good afternoon to everybody. Um, what I'm going to be sharing with you in the few minutes, if I can have my slides, please, is based on research. Uh, how do we understand the next generation traveler in terms of their attitudes, their needs, and their motivations? So, and the next I'm going to be touching on is what are the implications for urban design and technology? And finally, some examples from my part of the world, which is Singapore. The next slide, please. So when we look at the uh, new generation traveler, there are three dimensions we need to look at as far as their motivation and behavior and their needs concerned. So the first one is authenticity. So this is a generation that is very, their travel is a construction of their identity. So uh, they are very conscious, they are very curious and cautious traveler. So authenticity is at two levels. One is with respect to nature, with respect to their sense of well-being, and thirdly, with sustainability. So uh, destinations which tend to uh, be favorable to these destinations are those that leverage on uh, greening concepts. So green spaces, green corridors, uh, one that has got a decarbonization agenda, uh, walkability, pedestrianization, those sort of uh, destinations tend to appeal to them. Destinations that have got very high green index, for example, if you look at Singapore, it was by MIT recognized as the top country in the world for its green index, which is talking about the green canopy that is uh, above our city. Um, we have a vision of 2020 to have 80% of our buildings green, right? So these destinations would tend to appeal. Uh, the next dimension is authenticity with respect to lived and real experiences. So we are talking about this generation favoring uh, local experiences, living close to local neighborhoods. So what would that mean of, in terms of physical and digitally bringing these localized experiences which are very personal to these new generation travelers? So I want to introduce this concept of um, creative place making here because the concept of clear, uh, creative place making would avoid the whole idea of serial reproduction in cities, or what we call plagiarism of cities, right? So what this means is, in creative place making, we need to understand what is the distinctive character or the DNA of your destination or our destinations, and try to leverage on the creative industries like film, design, um, fashion, and of course, architecture. And Using that, bring the, the, the uh, distinctive character which is important uh, or which could have meaningful and inspiring connection with the new generation traveler. How do we do that? So perhaps in the panel, I'll share a little bit about what we have done here in Singapore to bring that sort of authenticity with the new generation traveler. The second dimension is flexibility, convenience, and choice. And this is one generation that in the way that they work, the way they live, and the way they play, they need that choice and that flexibility. So how do we provide that to them in terms of whether they are a bee leisure traveler, traveling on behalf of business, but they want to have that flexibility of also playing and experiencing that destination. Can we bring about urban cells, which is basically a 15-minute city that provides the core uh, tourism services? Or could we even look at decentralization of core tourism services to peripheral areas which are suburban and not congested in city centers uh, because they favor local neighborhoods and local experiences? Um, can we look at work-life integration where we use smart city technology and tourism to bring that sort of an integration with their work-life balance, right, when they travel? So whether it is going to be sharing economies like we work um, sort of workspaces that are found very close to neighborhood areas where they can actually have that sort of a uh, experience of integrating this. So we will talk more about that in just a bit. The final 
is how this uh, generation has got a preference for an integrated and interactive world. So what do we mean by that is that this generation transcends the boundaries of a physical world and a digital world. It transcends the boundaries of a professional world and a personal world. So how do we integrate that? And, and how do we use um, approaches like smart city planning to ensure that this tool can be integrated for them. They have a very high regard for a digital economy. They've got a very high regard for a sharing economy. And for example, uh, cities which are Instagrammable tend to appeal to them. And we are very delighted today, Singapore is now the number one most Instagrammable city in the world. So that appeals to, to this particular generation. So um, can cities also provide intelligent mobility? And that is important for them because it's sustainable, but at the same time provides convenience, provides flexibility. But how can we also allow for the be leisure traveler or the business traveler who prefers to work from anywhere? So this is a, a generation, it's not about work from home, but it's work from anywhere. So can we use smart technology and tourism to be able to allow them to work from anywhere, either uh, a living lab concept that I see the District 2020 is all about, right? Or we can provide for a digital twin where they can actually do that when they are able to stay away from the country of residence and to be in another city where they can work and enjoy tourism experiences at the same time. So um, the smart tourism concept that we are all talking about today would be where we address the final. But I just want to end uh, the, the, the presentation here by talking about at least the three concepts here that we need to think very carefully in, in a post-smart um, post approach to moving towards a wise approach. And I'll say a little bit more about that because uh, if we are focusing too much on smart tourism, then I think we might be very homogenizing just a bit. And we have to start thinking about a more human-centered approach to tourism because it's, tourism is very much a relational concept and not something very consumptive. And that's what I feel that smart tourism tends to do. And very quickly, I just want to share with you the next slide which actually features uh, Singapore as a biophilic city. And the word biophilic tend to be very important today. It's not just about us being a city in a garden or sitting in the nature uh, and having a thick uh, green canopy and green index, but the biophilic nature talks about the interrelationship of us and the ecosystem. And we focus a lot on that sort of an ecosystem where we respect the nature that is around us and how much of emphasis we give to that in terms of our livability in, in, in Singapore. So we'll, we'll probably touch that later on in the panel. And the next um, slide uh, is looking at uh, a, a small city. We are a very small city, but with, I think, very audacious goals and very big dreams. And one of the dreams that we, we hope would eventualize very soon is this uh, particular district, which is a Tenga district, which is in the neighborhood, but is going to be one of the best in terms of smartness. But at the same time, it's got to go have farm ways for people to engage in that. It would have also got gardens, a very thick canopy around that. It's going to be car light. In fact, all cars will be underground and not above the ground, all right? And it is going to be filled with nature, but local community is going to be there and inclusiveness is going to be uh, the primary concern in, in this particular development. The final development I just want to share with you is, is again a very big uh, ambitious goal, which is the next slide, please. Uh, which is the Pongo District Park. This is the epitome of smartness. So this is, this is going to be the latest where we have academic institutions, uh, scholars and, and students are going to be there, experimentation is going to happen, innovation is going to happen as well, car light streets, it's going to be filled with waterways and uh, waterways are already there, a living community is in there and it is going to be also be an incubation area for, for um, companies that are going to be in there as well. Very very interesting idea. It's, it's unfolding very quickly and beautifully, and I'm looking forward to this as well. So um, finally, this is the best news I've seen recently <laughs> before I came in here, that we are now the most Instagrammable place in the world. So with that, I end uh, my short presentation, and hopefully during the panel, I will share a little bit more about the experiences in, from Singapore. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Nisha. We're definitely looking forward to hearing a little bit more as we continue the conversation later. But for now, I'd like to turn it over to Michael, who is remote. Hi, Michael. So nice to see you. Hi. Thank you so Good much for being Sarah. with us. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. Um, unfortunately, I can't be there in person, but I will try my best to virtually uh, contribute to the conference. Thank you. We're um, looking forward to having you. Thank you. Um, I, obviously, um, I'm a passionate architect um, who believes that design and technology are key generators in the development of our future cities. Our cities are inhabited by residents and travelers who interact with the city through different experiences. It is these experiences that I believe can attract new generations to our cities in the future. Before the COVID pandemic, there was already a desire in my industry to look into sustainability, wellness, and technology to be the design generators for our buildings of the future. But since the COVID pandemic, this interest has accelerated extremely with more focus on people's health and well-being. So first of all, I just want to talk about the sustainable experience. When you travel to any new city or you live in an existing one, the integration of a sustainable living has become a key factor. In our projects, we want to create a stronger connection to the natural environment. We want to use local natural building materials to reduce the carbon footprint of our buildings. It's these ideas I want to share. If, if we look at the first project uh, in Zhanghong, China. So this is very interesting. It was inspired a lot by what our, our team has done in Singapore, but it was actually looking at the full city and identifying parks and green spaces uh, that we uh, can then revitalize, basically with the aim of allowing the residents of that city to get closer to nature and to experience the natural resources that they have of nature in their city. So if, if you go uh, move on to uh, what, we, what we call these are connectors. So we created a series of connectors through these forests, which actually connected into the city. Along these connectors, we created uh, activity pavilions for well-being, for relaxation, for fitness. Um, so the idea that is that nature is driven into the city and people can access it. Another project which also looks at the environment is a project I done in Sri Lanka. This project is a high-end hospitality project in a very beautiful site in Sri Lanka. And our main focus here is actually to have the lightest possible footprint into nature that we can possibly achieve. So you can see these pods are actually the rooms and they're lightly imposed into nature. So we completely restrict, respect and work with nature in our design. And then the next project in terms of sustainability, which is very important to us, is materiality. So this is a resort hotel in, in China, but the local timber and the local um, source of timber was very rich in this, in, in this uh, site. So we wanted to use that natural resource to develop the architecture into a modern vernacular architecture in this hotel. In all our, our projects, wellness is also very important in promoting the well-being of the guests and the residents of the city. The next generation of young and old people are more concerned about their physical and mental well-being. As designers, we are responding to this with, through new building typologies. There is a growing interest in fitness hotels, wellness resorts, where the guest is attracted to having an immersive, regenerative experience. I recently designed a wellness resort, uh, which we can see. Um, which is actually a smaller scale hotel, which is more respectful that people want to be in a smaller scale experience. We've regenerated gardens. And in this facility, your diet is controlled, your fitness regime is controlled, you've got medical diagnostic. And the whole idea is you revitalize your body and mind. Um, on a more urban context, um, we can see a, a project that we've done, which is actually a fitness hotel uh, on the next slide. And this is where fitness is a DNA of the hospitality experience with high activity spaces, low activity spaces. This is a running, machine, running facility inside the lobby. Um, and we actually look into, because people want to exercise and want to be, take part in these activities uh, to look after their well-being. And we even explored this further into the rooms of the hotels where uh, you actually bring in gym equipment so people can have that experience inside the room as well. 
Through all of this, technology has been a driver in our designs and will be. And I believe technology is there to en enhance the experience with the building and the city fabric. As designers, we envision a future where technology and the environment is a seamless experience. This can be seen in a project that we recently developed for a client where he wanted to push the boundaries of a futuristic hospitality experience. In this hotel, we were challenging the realms of uh, engineering construction technology to create an iconic design, Instagrammable, as you say, and also looking at the room design where we're looking at touch services and the seamless uh, experience of technology and people. We are currently working with our clients reimagining future cities with a vision to attract future generations to our projects. And I look forward to discussing these points further in the discussions today. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. And as somebody who obviously works at a travel magazine, I'm very, I've seen some of these developments coming into hotel projects, and I'm really excited to see more about the hotel of the future. And Xavi, looking forward to hearing what you have to say about technology, especially as it relates to our experience here at Expo. Thank you. Thank you very much. So wanted to start saying that what we've lived in the last couple of years have been a massive disruption of nearly everything, right? So on one side, so we've seen a massive disruption of everything we're doing in the way we live and the way we work. And this impacted all our industries, all our businesses, and um, just a second, impacted in a way that um, only a few manage to get it right. And this is important because the reality is that um, we're seeing wildfires in Australia, we're seeing uh, um, disruptions in economies in, in China, in, in, in multiple areas, um, and then COVID hit. And COVID brought us, all of us, home. And we saw a few industries, a few within and in the travel, in the tourism industry, we saw a few players that really got it right because they digitized, they brought technology really at the center. And we're going to talk a lot about technology as an enabler, and we're going to reflect about how Expo has been a reflect of this as well throughout the journey. We saw that the leaders in the digital space pre-pandemic were 2x doing better than any other of the players around that. So they were doing better revenues, they were engaging better with the customers. The pandemic, their digital readiness allowed them to accelerate even farther. And as they come out and recover, their digital readiness accelerated and they are 5x growing faster than the rest of the players, right? And why this happened? Because the reality, as human beings, we faced four completely new realities. One, the human experience. All of a sudden, we were all locked in our house. We were completely separated from the interaction, the human interaction, what we have today, which is so precious. Technology dramatically changed and realized things that I've never seen before. Take the COVID vaccine. So before in the past, we, we needed 10 years to synthesize a vaccine. Today, Moderna, through the technology they implemented at scale, they had digital studios, everything connected, bringing data, AI together, they managed to synthesize a vaccine that is effective, still date, much faster than ever seen before. Then work. We stopped working from the office and we started working from home. We stopped traveling all of a sudden and we managed to do things that we thought were never possible before from home. And of course, all this, there was a common denominator, a more incredible focus on sustainability. Because if in the past we were saying that every future business needs to have digital at the center, what we're seeing now, to survive every business in the future, and travel and tourism needs to reflect a lot on that, it's a sustainable business. Sustainability is gonna be the name of the game because if we've gone through a massive pandemic impact through COVID, what we're heading through the climate change is gonna make that 10 times or 100 times even worse unless we take action now. Sustainability needs to be from the top to the bottom a priority. So there's, there's a new way that we're seeing that tourism 
will be reimagined, reinvented, right? So there is a magic tour uh, that we're seeing for travel, for tourism to go through, where the experience are going to be fundamentally better personalized. Interactions are going to be absolutely uh, data-driven and micro, uh, ultra convenient. And we're going to see priorities completely uh, uh, reshaped. And why? We're seeing four key technologies that enable that. One is distribution ledgers. Everything related to blockchain and so on is going to be at the core. Second, AI, data, data everywhere. To personalization, we need data across. Third, XR, VR, MR, extended reality, virtual reality. There's a lot of things we can showcase without having to be there, anticipating for a travel, for an experience. And last but not least, quantum to maximize the time to market on those. And the reality, we're seeing the executive in the travel, we've done a survey, a global survey as Accenture uh, across the end industry, and we're seeing 92% of the executives of all the companies understand that the travel and tourism industry is changing rapidly. And they're testing things, innovating on things, but they are still not scaling them. So it's time to scale. It's no longer time for pilots. And not only that, they're seeing that these technologies will change dramatically in the next few years how they operate. But the reality, today, a lot of the, 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 the processes still really remain unchanged. So there is a, a call to action for faster movement, right? Leveraging all these technologies to accelerate. And, and, and this will make uh, impact about how operations need to be fully re-engineered, so how we use uh, and how we manage these technologies to do better crew schedules, uh, man, ma the maintenance of the fleet, and so on. There's so many things we can do through technology. Uh, as well, the individual, the convenience uh, needs to be refined. So uh, robots, AI can be applied at scale to optimize experiences, to, uh, to bridge the gaps of languages, and so on. And last but, last but not least, we need to reimagine travel with virtual tours, with virtual experiences, and so on, anticipating. I'm going to show some experiences what we've done here in Expo now. And uh, to close, the customer. The customer is to be completely reconsidered. How do we treat the customer? How do we operate with them? How do we engage with them, right? And now bring it quickly into the Middle East. The Middle East is a, 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 a number of economies that were oil-centric and are still oil-centric today, and they're massively pivoting into diversification. They all have the vision 2030s, and we will see that all those bring travel and tourism really at the center of this. And Expo is a great example of this. I recall when we were starting this, I was part, I, was the, uh, I had the privilege to be part of the design from scratch of the experience of everything you see here from the technology, from the digitization. And the vision was, let's make this the best experience not only of a traditional expo, which is business to business, but a business to consumer with a lot of uh, new experiences underpinned through technologies on food, on queuing, on retail, on everything. We said we're going to discuss more on the panel on this, right? And all this bringing the two parts, the human side together with the technology. We're going to talk more about that. And to do this, to do this, many different dimensions, but we always started by the customer experience. We identified what do we, the visitors of Expo want to do? What type of archetypes of visits we're going to have, right? The ones that come from fe, uh, for leisure, the ones that come from business, the government ones, the way they interact, and how you, should I use data AI? How should I use innovation in the cloud? All this pool of technologies really made the difference. So for us, sustainability, technology, and of course, the human side at the center. And uh, I'd like to close with this uh, quote and hopefully uh, have a more debate around how we del delivered all this extra experience together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Javier. Thank you to you and thank you to all of our panelists for their opening statements. And so now we're going to start the discussion portion. And I would love for anybody to also raise their hands and ask questions as we go along the way. But first, I wanted to start with something that I've just had on my mind a lot as we've been kind of going through this pandemic, where we were on a different trajectory, everybody was, before 2019. And when it came to a lot of the topics we're talking about today, with hospitality, the hotel industry was definitely moving towards a trend of, you know, 
um, really communal spaces and shared living and things like that. In sustainability, we were all think, trying to think of our own personal footprints and what we could do with single-use plastics and things like that and avoiding that and just kind of avoiding harsh chemicals and just how we interacted with our environments on a personal level. And with technology as well, we were kind of doing different things and then we've had all these pivots that have been happening. So with technology, the QR code is something I've been thinking about a lot. It was something that was pretty much in 2019, nobody knew what to do with and kind of was not really there. Now it's been back from the dead where it's a vital part of the post-pandemic life. And with sustainability, on, a, you know, on the other note, it's sort of like we were going towards this direction, but now there's been a lot more masks everywhere and you know, people, people using harsher chemicals when they do their cleaning because they're so nervous. And then with hospitality, obviously it's a lot of social distancing and that means we can't have the communal spaces. So I'm really curious to hear from each of you about some of the trajectories we were on and the types of pivots that you've seen and that we've had to do in each of our different spaces. And so I thought perhaps we could start with Michael because this is something we've seen a lot with hospitality where you've had to reimagine the way a lot of these hotels and um, these spaces are designed now for the new normal. So Michael, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yes, Sarah. Um, the, the, the trend at the minute um, is obviously more intimate. Um, hotels that we're designing are smaller, they're, they're more dispersed, um, the spaces and the connection they have with nature is stronger. Um, so I guess coming at a hotel now it might be a smaller, more intimate hotel. That hotel would be located deeper into the nature and then there would be activities that people will then go and experience the environment more rather than a very large scale urban hotel, which would have been of the trend maybe five or 10 years ago. Um, our clients are now looking at these more discreet, smaller uh, and dedicated experiences uh, for travelers. And then obviously in terms of the urban hotel, we're seeing that there, there's a trend that with a business leisure that people, when they go on business, they want to have their uh, exercise activities. They want to have the things that they're used to and, but obviously um, they want to do it in the room or they want to do it in a more secure environment uh, rather than in large gatherings of people. And then it's also challenging because a lot of the design that you've been working on has been in the works for a long time. So what sort of pivots have you had to make in some of the projects that you're already working on to keep in mind some of these new changes and needs? Yeah, well, a lot of our clients and I, it's, it's a lot of exploration. So they're re revisioning, re-exploring. Um, and they're, they're really, um, you know, it's changing on, on a daily basis, really. Um, and then I, I think someone just mentioned, um, you know, it's, it's, it's taking the next big step to turning these visions into reality, because then that takes a lot of investment. Construction periods can be up to three, four years. So um, it's very much uh, the clients are still um, waiting to mm -hmm. see what happens. Um, but obviously they do these smaller boutique, which are, we, we believe is a safer uh, investment for the clients. They're, they're moving ahead with those rather than the larger scale projects. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know, what, what is your feeling, uh, your experience? Well, I'd actually love to hear more from both of you as well. Well, one of the things yeah. I would like to say is that the nature of travel that we, 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 we had in the past where business and leisure were quite balanced, if mm -hmm. you will, and growing heavily, and all the infrastructure was catered for that, is pivoting now because companies have seen that you can, be a, you can have a productive work remotely. Mm -hmm. You don't need 100% of the time the face-to-face -face interaction, which is always very relevant in some occasions, but in many others not. If it were only three months of pandemic, that wouldn't have not settled in the PL of the companies. Mm. And it's been two years mm. and it's continuing and businesses are continuing to prove. So I think there is a reimagination about what the future of travel will take for business, right? Mm -hmm. Even for leisure, right? Yeah. Because may, they may come earlier back into or, or uh, back into a normal, but business, a lot of the business travel will never eventually get where it was. Mm -hmm. It needs to be reimagined, yeah. right? And I think here it is where the technologies, the XR, VR, and so on, we've seen. We all Zoom, web, uh, WebEx, and so on, and continue to push. So I think this is one of the major disruptors from these days, and will change the infrastructure, hospitality, and everything. Yeah. 
And also actually on hospitality and just actual as it relates to spaces, the business travelers are now traveling with their families because there's remote school and because both partners are often working. So now it's not just a business traveler would have a single hotel room and that's all they needed and they needed the technology infrastructure. Now they need to have space and they need to actually think of business travel combined with family travel. It's this new hybrid traveler we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, if you look at these statistics in the research, when you look at the new generation traveler, we have 94% claiming that they will do be leisure travel in, in the recovery phase. Mm -hmm. you know? So whether destinations are gonna be prepared in terms of how do you entice the be leisure travelers to come to your destination with that infrastructure, uh, mixed developments, for example, and um, also in terms of smart technology mm -hmm. that will support them from working from anywhere in the world. And, and we are not talking about short span of time, perhaps, we could also look at prolonged periods of time where people would actually move to another destination mm -hmm. and work from there. So we have new words like, you know, slow nomads, for example. Mm -hmm. They are nomadic when they are working, but they're going to another destination, but they prefer a slower lifestyle because the pandemic, whether you like it or not, has affected us emotionally, mentally, and socially. So that's one thing that we need to look at. And I think in a very hyper-connected world, uh, we also see a heightened sense of loneliness that has happened during the pandemic as well. So uh, how do we use smart technology to create a relational sort of um, work when people travel or relational tourism experiences when people travel becomes very important for us to think about. So technology, uh, we've got to be very careful about the overuse of that and smartness uh, of technology and city planning because again, we are in a very unprecedented and extraordinary time where although we are hyper-connected, but we are also looking at a situation where people are uh, emphasizing bonding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you, if you couple this with the sense of um, sustainability, mm -hmm. so people is more and more conscious about the carbon footprint yes. they live, right? On every step they do. And you see new generations even more aware of that. Mm -hmm. I would say that th there is a call to action as well on that that will change the the pattern of behaviors of consumers. Mm -hmm. But then how do we do that authentically? Because I think now we're also seeing sustainability as a buzzword, right? So how are the destinations that you're familiar with actually leveraging what their efforts and their impacts are in a way that actually feels authentic and relates to the travelers and really entices them? It's gonna be a combination. It's gonna be a, a combination of things because there, there's, uh, indeed people is more conscious and, and, and it will imply first from the architectural mm -hmm. side it's a call to action to you guys because you will need to rethink spaces that, as you were mentioning, people travel with the family in a leisure space or in a maybe lower cost space. Mm. So it happened in the States, right? Mm. So uh, the Bay Area that used to be super expensive and so on saw a lot of emigrants mm -hmm. going into lower cost areas within the States because then they could, and they could work remotely perfectly well. Mm -hmm. So created booms of uh, opportunity elsewhere. So there's migration flows that yeah. will change. And so this requires urban planning, architecture, to cater for all these yeah. new types of consumption. Yeah. And it's also an interesting opportunity yeah. for cities because I think in the early, the first phase of the pandemic in 2020, people were more leaving the cities for more remote areas. But now, because as you're saying, we're seeking these human interactions and we're missing a lot of the dynamism of the cities that we love. So now there is an opportunity for cities to attract those people back who are kind of out and seeking those socially distant, isolated destinations. Indeed. And then, Shavi, I would actually love to hear more from you because obviously we are at Expo and um, you know, technology has been a bit driving factor for Expo from the beginning, but obviously with everything that happened with the pandemic, you've had to pivot, you've had to make a lot of changes, add new technology and new experiences to make this viable and to make it the amazing event that it is today. So can you talk a little bit about that journey with Expo specifically? Indeed. So I, actually, we, we, I recall starting from, this was a, a pile of sand one tree, the tree of life, nothing else, and a design, a concept. Amazing. And we said, how can we ensure that this, and we didn't even know about COVID. It was not completely unheard of. So we wanted to make already by design the most sustainable space uh, ever, which means because expos in general, most of the buildings are dropped, are not misused else, uh, everywhere in the world, right? We have experience, and we said, no, by design, we want more 80 or more percent of the construction remains. And that's why it's very important to plan up front what's going to happen after Expo. So that is the legacy of Expo. And how we make this uh, the smartest city on earth 
with cloud, 5G, and so on, so that it can be embraced as a hub for innovation companies and so on. So it was by the design of it, right? And, and all this to cast the design through how the space need to be, the experiences need to be, and the technology on this, right? And, and today, when, when you scroll this, this uh, street, you see the robots from mm -hmm. Talabad delivering, you, you, uh, you see the drones doing shows yeah. and, and there. So, so much, but we have the airport here. So you need a complete new airspace protected from the drones here because we have the airport there and you, you cannot have interferences. Mm. So a lot of things were had to be considered to be overlaid mm -hmm. to create this. So one of the things we said, this is the, smart, the smartest city today in the world because there are so many layers, but it's an invisible technology. Yeah. We, don't, we didn't want the technology to be visible everywhere. There's, there's so many video uh, surveillance to ensure to avoid the stampedes, to avoid all this, but all this needs to be invisible to make sure that we make it the most human and sustainable mm. possible, right? Mm. So it was by design. Mm. That's exciting. It's been really exciting to see it all play out too, or to not see it, the things that are not visible. Correct. And to see how seamlessly it works. And, and just maybe just one other remark is when COVID hit, a lot of the design of the spaces mm. were very touch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So everything, the interaction was about touching this and experiences. So a lot, a lot of the effort was how to make touch touchless, mm -hmm. how to take uh, biometrics to be able to recognize faces, to be able to. So it, it took a lot of effort mm -hmm. of reengineering what in the beginning yeah. was more a touch driven experience, right? Yeah. So these these are things that uh, from the uh, from the hindsight. Seem, seem simple, but it, it required a lot of effort to pivot, and thanks to the technology underlay, mm -hmm. allowed to uh, reshape and innovate on, on the solutions that we, yeah. we, we developed. Well, it's amazing, and I think we can all agree that it's been really fascinating to see it all unfold. It's amazing seeing it live, right? Yeah, so, uh, definitely. January 2020, for us, uh, February was tough. We said, wow, is it going to happen? Yeah. Right? But here, I think we had the, the leadership of uh, the minister, Her Excellency Rim was was fantastic. Right? Yeah. She said, we're stopping, uh, we're closing down, but we will come back and we're going to make the best desk forever. And I think leadership in this type of things really uh, are the only the way forward. Right? Definitely. And this has now been like, this is a role model to the rest of the world. I think everybody's eyes are on Expo and some of the innovations that are happening here. And we're going to see this roll out throughout the world. Um, in the coming years. And actually, Michael, I wanted to bring you in on this too, because some of this invisible technology that has been implemented in Expo and these, these new experiences are obviously, you spoke a bit about the importance of technology in hotels, but what are some of the new things that you've had to add in the last few years? Like, can you give us some examples of some of the changes and how technology has been able to integrate? Um, well, for us, the technology is about uh, information management. So like uh, Singapore is a leading uh, 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 city in, the, in this implementation that the whole city is, is built virtually inside the computer and all of our designs um, is actually built virtually. So the, the information technology that's driving our designs now can monitor the water flow, can monitor the heat, can monitor the people moving through the building. So it allows us to have so much information uh, at, the, at, the, at the designer's fingertips to basically improve the design. And then when that design then gets built and realized, all of that integrated knowledge and the information technology model is passed on to the building user. Uh, and that model is plugged into the city model. So then it, all, of a, all of a sudden your city becomes this integrated information model, which is, is basically what Javier is saying as well. And then you can then control and understand and make your city more efficient and respond to the people of the city because like I, I'm an architect and all our designs are some, respond to people. And I love technology, but for me, the most important thing is people. And then technology is there to in, embrace people and to make life more efficient and better for people, not to be the driver of just doing technology for the sake of it. So for, for us, um, it's all about that uh, high level of information now that we get. And then also using AI um, to help in our design process mm -hmm. that we can then have all this information and use AI models to give us um, different options and studies and um, so we can explore the design in a, in a more efficient uh, process. Great, thank you. And then Dr. Nisha, I wanted to ask you, we spoke a little bit, or you spoke a little bit about authenticity and the, the need for travelers to live like a local in a sense, which is I think a trend that has definitely preceded the pandemic, but more so now that people are looking to relocate for longer periods. So how can this hyper-localization really be used to attract travelers to new cities? 
You're talking about creativity or? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I would say that um, when it comes to like, you know, localization of experiences for the new gen traveler, um, the, thing, the thing we have to think about is, you know, how do we bring creativity in place making, mm -hmm. right? Creating a sense of place in our destination that would be able to bring that distinctive character and DNA of a place. So uh, whether it's the physical space or using a digital space, how do we connect uh, the traveler with the local experiences become very important and how we think creatively regarding this is, is critical. So um, maybe I'll just share a little bit from, from Singapore. So we've been experimenting with this quite a fair bit because we, we've got a very strong culture in Singapore that um, that we, we want that to surface. And although we are part of the larger Asia, how do we create distinctiveness about Singapore in the eyes of the traveler? So uh, there's a particular precinct that's called the Kampung Glam precinct, which is where the Arab street is, like the Middle East is in there sort of thing. So uh, we've got conservation buildings, we've got heritage in there. And um, so we, we conserve the houses in there and we create that awareness of the heritage and culture in there as well. And we bring in local artisans, the, the enterprises, the shops in there, um, showcase the, the traditional art of oud making, for example, um, and, and as well as uh, gastronomy that has been there for, for decades there in Singapore. Uh, we have mural art on, on, on the uh, shop houses in there. Um, and we, we do this thing called co-creation, all right, where it's important to co-create an experience of uh, the people who visit, the people who live in there, as well as the people who work in there. So you, you need to create a co-creation of that experience. And how that happens is when the travelers come in there and they sit down, they, they, they are by the, the roadsides and enjoying themselves, and that creates that ambience uh, of that particular area. Uh, we have artists performing in there. But what is impressive is the technology that we are using. And a whole digital transformation has happened where the government has started to work with digital companies um, to look at e-commerce in there to push notification on what is happening inside like workshops that are going on in there uh, to look at intelligent mobility, working with Grab uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a app uh, hailing uh, company. And so how do they deploy these sort of things and, and in totality create that experience to people? And what, what uh, Xavier mentioned about the technology should not be so stark, you know, that it destroys the authenticity of the place, yeah. you know. It's got to be done so subtly that it, it's convenience, it's flexibility, but at the same time, it creates the ease, you know, uh, in which people can access the information in there. So beautifully done that that place is now ranked as one of the best tourism spots there in Singapore, regardless of whether it's COVID or not, but mm -hmm. it's still thriving as a destination. So I would say that's a, a beautiful example of an interplay of innovation, mm -hmm. and I'm talking about technological innovation, but we look at social innovation at the same time, and that I think that's primary, and also look at how we could use creativity from the creative industries, you know, to bring that alive in terms of authenticity. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if I may, one of the, sure, to, to deliver all that, there is one thing that we, we have now, which is underlying everything, which is data. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, we have so many, we, we, we are hyper-connected, all of Absolutely. us. Absolutely, yeah. And we have so many points of contact that allow us to build a digital twin of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the more we can use this data to create the so what, what is relevant for this person vis-a-vis right. -vis what is relevant for that person. Mm -hmm. I think this, this is an area where I think there's still a lot to be developed. And when I see the case of Singapore, and we work very closely with Changi Airport to create all the experience of passengers mm. in Changi. Mm. And Changi every year stands as the best airport in the world. Mm -hmm. Or yeah. not by chance, because the oh, design, nice. the, design, yeah. the, the yeah. design mindset, the innovation mindset of the leadership there about, I want to make sure that the spaces are, and you don't see this technology, but it's everywhere. Yeah. The, the, the time between one side to the other, the, the experience, the food, the so everything is super well personalized through data, mm -hmm. right? And, and I would say that there is an effort to be done by the industry beyond that mm -hmm. to embrace that data to be able to personalize Absolutely. the experiences. Mm -hmm. yes. Because at times where we're going to be fighting for a smaller cake, because there's not that many travelers yeah. like in the past, to get the larger share, we're going to be more personalized. We need to be more relevant. Yeah. 
that's right. And that's really what hyperlocalization is all about. In exactly. Yeah. Definitely. Now, these are wonderful examples from Singapore, which make me even more eager to get back there as soon yes. as borders reopen. It's been far too long. Um, and I think something I'm also just really curious about from all of you is who, where do you look for your expertise and guidance right now? Because a lot of this, as we keep saying, we are, un, we are in unprecedented times. So who, what are your North Stars? How do you kind of see what research do you turn to? What role models do you turn to to really help us navigate these unusual times? And Xavier, perhaps we can talk, start with you. Look, look um, it, it's a great question because uh, as we, with all the changes that we're experiencing, and I was sharing some, some, some pictures about how the world has changed, the reality is that we need to go back to the human beings, mm -hmm. asking, interrogating the people how their experiences are changing, and based on that, how their preferences. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to connect. Now, you, again, back onto the data, based on the behaviors through mob mobility, yeah. you, you, you get to know a lot about people. So there's a lot of insights mm -hmm. about behaviors, about feelings, and so on, you can get without even having to interact, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of data, digi digital research we do, mm -hmm. and then we couple with physical research interviews and so on, and every uh, three to six months we conduct research across the impacts mm -hmm. of what we're living into the behaviors and to the, the, the futures, mm -hmm. the futures because of the businesses, of the people, of the technologies, of the spaces and so on, right? So back to basics, interrogate people. And that's what we did in Expo. Mm -hmm. Before we la landed the experience, we interviewed people from all over the world. We had an estimate about where is going to be the co people coming here. And we asked, uh, what do you expect from Expo? The first thing we understood is people do not know what an Expo is. Mm -hmm. It was a, a, a amazing process. the response. 90x percent were completely deviated. They, they thought it was completely different. To, so there was an, then a so what about education mm -hmm. about. Before coming come to Dubai, we said, Okay, then let me explain you what an expo is and how you can get the, a great experience for your mm -hmm. remember. And so there's a lot of dynamism then. It's nothing you can't rely on long-term case studies or research like that. You really have to just evolve in the moment. Exactly. And it's co-creation, as you said, yeah, right? So because you need, to, you need to define the solutions based on the inputs and then revert back, is it what you're looking and then fine tune. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Nisha, what kind of resources have you been looking towards? Okay, so, so when you look at tourism, because I come from that industry, I. I wouldn't say that there's so much of research that is available there, and whatever we used to collect will become irrelevant or has become yeah. irrelevant now. But I would say that you know there is enough research done cross-sector, mm -hmm. cross-discipline, right? So when you look at architecture, like for the topic today we are talking about, you draw information from architecture, for example, on what are the needs of the new traveler with respect to architecture. You take a little bit from environmental design, you know, and what they are looking at in terms of the design of the environment and sustainability, and you draw from there. And it is management research, like Deloitte talked about, you know, um, urban design and what are the top 10 um, things that we need to note in urban design. And McKinsey talks about, you know, the new gen uh, workforce mm -hmm. or people. So what you do need to do now is to, to intelligently or intelligently use intelligent data, yeah. you know, and you have to try to, to make strategic decisions from that. It's very difficult to do organic research and try to, to find a solution to what we're doing. So now I think cross-sector collaborations are important when we start to make decisions of this sort. Cross-discipline information becomes very critical. And I think this is where consultants come in. They, they make sense of data, bring it to, to tourism organizations or hotels, and we make our decisions based on that mm -hmm. at the moment, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And then, Michael, how about you for architecture and hospitality design in particular? Where have you been looking in the last two years to get your inspiration? Yeah, I, again, it's a lot of collaboration. So currently, we're collaborating with other um, specialists in the entertainment field and the hospitality field across the world, actually, uh, and reimagining projects. And, and basically, that all comes into trying to understand where the industry is going. And, 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 there, and there's no clear answer, you know what I mean? And that, that's why a lot of our clients are, are really, you know, digging in and trying to understand it and doing this visioning exercise. Um, so it, it is a little bit of, um, you know, let's put something down on paper, let's brainstorm it, let's discuss it, let's, um, let's test it. And then obviously we work with uh, financial consultants and business monitors then to then put some numbers against that in terms of number of people, capacities, and how, how that thing can work as a business model. So, so that's where we are at the minute, but it's that collaboration 
um, from basically many different sector specialists to feed into the architecture environment. And then on the sustainability side, obviously we work with sustainable engineers and we're looking at energy, we're looking at all the carbon footprint and, and, and pushing that part of the design process, process as well. Um, so then in the future generations of our buildings, our buildings will be less carbon footprint and more environmentally friendly. So it's a really exciting period of time for designers because we get to explore and get to um, create. Um, so it would be interesting to see how it develops over the next couple of years. Definitely, it's very challenging, but it definitely inspires a lot of creativity, I'm sure. Yeah. And so I think the next question I have for all of you is what cities and, um, you know, obviously we talked a little about the research and the inspiration you get in the data, but what cities do you think that you each look to as inspirations and, you know, what projects are out there that are really exciting you right now? Well, I'm, I'm going to be very biased and I'm going to take for Barcelona, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm originally from there, I'm Catalan, and, and so I, one of the things that drives me is the, the spirit of keeping the old mm -hmm. and preserving the old, but uh, l building a layer of intelligence to uh, bring the new as well mm -hmm. on the space, right? And uh, creating hubs of innovation, startups, areas within the city, so cities within the city, mm. where people really can feel them uh, inspired by the, not only the individuals, but the community, because today we evolve through ecosystem interaction, right? So we, you, you never stand, so you need to create those areas of conjunction, uh, of, of clash of uh, different in, in individuals, technologies, and so on. And Barcelona has been able to create a smart city, but mm. as well a digital twin of the whole Barcelona, mm. from which they make decisions around you know, waste management, uh, um, uh, flows uh, the, or, or due, due to rains, um, all traffic management, and very smartly manage a city that is very dense, mm -hmm. that attracts many tourists, and that wants to continue to be the relevant city for the locals, right? Mm -hmm. I liked it as a benchmark. Now, as a North Star, the, the vision of Neom in mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia, or even I would, we could say Mazdar in Abu Dhabi, mm. would be things to, to think about. Right. There's a lot of learning in the process of executing this, right? So it's not it's not a critical, and, and I think uh, Richard, you mentioned some some of your cities that you're creating that being sustainably really at the center. So. Interesting to hear from you, but, but I think those in this part of the world, a lot is being said in new cities. This, is, this wants to become one of the smart cities of the future. But as well, I would, I would like to refer to my dear Barcelona because I think there's a lot being built on the, on the basics of the traditional yeah. city. And that's fascinating too because it's, there's such a, it's such a long, old, historical city and to have this much innovation and development, it's like really fascinating to see how it's integrated. Exactly. And then, Michael, maybe we could switch to you then and hear what you have to say. Who are you excited about out in the world today? Well, obviously, I work in the Middle East as a region, but Singapore um, is an inspiration because actually the, the integration and the, the, how it's uh, worked with nature is very inspiring for designers. So I think they have got a, a lot of things right in their, uh, their footprint and their vision is very, very insightful. Um, going back to old cities, you know, there's a lot of old cities in Europe um, and across the world. And what, it, what it's, I think, going back to the past is also something we can learn from. And like, if you look at an old city, you know, they use the raw materials from their local region to build their city. They did not import um, materials from all across the world. So I think also to look back at the past and see how older buildings were, were constructed and um, Use, the use of local materials, um, I think is something that um, we should look at going forward to. Um, and then obviously that brings in a sense of DNA for each city because, uh, you know, there was a globalization of architecture about 30 years ago where, you know, there was glass buildings everywhere just because people wanted to be like a certain country. So I think about bringing that DNA back in design is, is very important to what we do in our, our projects. And actually looking at a city that's already there, like Barcelona or Dubai or Singapore, and I'm trying to understand the DNA um, to understand how that architecture and that design can reflect the, the locality um, as well, which I, I feel is very important to basically create identity. And this goes back to what will attract people as travelers. They will be attracted by identity and DNA mm -hmm. and a local uh, understanding of a region uh, which I think is very important. Yeah. 
And then Dr. Nisha, I was actually really um, intrigued by the, some of the slides that you had in your presentation because obviously Singapore is a very small destination yeah. and to have this much like history but also such amazing developments in the in the pipeline. Uh, I think I've got a very high regard for Singapore, not because I'm a Singaporean, <laughs> but you know, but I just want to say something about, you know, the more we, we think about all these sort of, you know, concepts of urban design, perhaps that at one point we've got to think about not going too much into over-design, because when you over-design, you tend to homogenize destinations, and one would tend to look like another. You know, a serial reproduction might happen. Sometimes, perhaps, we need to look at an under-design, mm -hmm. where maybe let creativity surface, you know, co-creation can actually happen as a result of under-design, and that is what is going to bring the distinctive DNA of a particular place. And I, I was actually awed by, uh, because we, I'm, I'm so into to the creative component of a, of a destination, um, Recife Brazil, mm -hmm. right, was actually had this uh, whole sitting in the making, which is the uh, Playtown Recife, you know, and it was basically about creating a play city, right? And I love the whole idea of it because it was almost like as if they were doing design thinking in the way that they were creating a play city out of that. So um, they brought in 300 over tech companies to conceptualize how they want to bring this city into a play city. And they did a hackathon of, of bottom up to get the, the stakeholders at the ground level to, to conceptualize different ideas. And they had an immersion lab where they did a prototype of the ideas and what came up was a result of that. So they have aquatic pathways, they have fortune telling bus stops, uh, poetic sculptures, you know? And I, I think that interactive dimension would bring the distinct character of what that place is all about, you know? And, and I think for me, tourism should not be purely consumptive, where people come in, I consume something from their destination, and off I go. Yeah. It should be very relational. It should be very, there's a social form behind, force behind tourism. So when people come into a destination, they should learn to understand the character of the destination. They should learn to appreciate uh, for what the, the, the people uh, are all about and respect that and take that away and, and hopefully co-create something that they can leave behind. And for me, the word regenerative always comes back. It's not just about sustainability, but how can we you know, be more, even more regenerative and not take away and leave something better when we leave? So I think uh, with the new gen traveler and, and uh, most of us are now beginning to think about that dimension when we travel. So I am a little bit uh, often very uh, wary of smart tourism because it's like what uh, Xavier said, it's, it's, you know, it's trying to determine what people want, mm -hmm. what people think, and how do we do this? How do we give them? You know? It's all about centered on, on that sort of consumption, right? But we need to flip it a little because really tourism is so relational mm -hmm. in that sense. And there must be a human-centric approach to the way we design so that it becomes actually a social force. And now more than ever, because now we're seeing people traveling for longer time, they're not doing the buck list travel, bucket list travel anymore. So it is that much more important that we think that way. That's right. I think we are going to start wrapping it up now. So I'd love to hear just a few final words about the way forward from each of you. And perhaps we can start with Michael. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, well, for us, uh, we've got a lot of exciting projects on the drawing board, and um, which embrace in all of these ideas. Unfortunately, I can't share them with you because they're confidential. But um, I think the future for us is, um, you know, seeing that these new ideas come through into fruition, and seeing these new projects getting built in the coming years. Um, for, for me, uh, the, on the hospitality side, it, it is more about that more experiential uh, hospitality experience at the minute for our projects, which are more remote, uh, more intimate, and more um, and smaller. Um, but um, but they are also a very exciting uh, projects. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Nisha? Well, I think um, we are living at a time where things are changing so fast. You know, whatever we accumulated in terms of intelligence and data has been outdated. We are starting from scratch. Uh, we don't know where this is going to lead, but uh, we, we have to be, I think, right now, be very intelligent, very strategic. We have to look at uh, role models and try to be very 
act in the way that we take these and bring it to our own destinations mm -hmm. and avoid the whole idea of sameness and homogenization by looking at another city and see if we can transfer that to, into our cities. So a lot more effort has now to be put in to bring distinctive characters, mm -hmm. understanding our DNA, what are we all about, and then try to strategize in, in a very, very intelligent manner. Mm -hmm. I think travelers can see right through that when it's just a little bit of replication. So it's very important to be authentic to each destination. Absolutely. For sure. And Xavier, would you like to close it out for us? Yes. Um, when, when I look at the future, I, I would like to. I, I envision a future where people will be much more conscious about their carbon, fu carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. There will be um, footprint, carbon footprint uh, passports for individuals. People will take travel destinations based on that, mm -hmm. about how sustainable their and eventually, people will, dis will, will take decisions to travel to the metaverse yeah. and, 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 and meet people, meet experiences, enjoy cities from a digital way mm -hmm. through a complete different reality sense. So it's still very far-fetched from where we are today. But I think there's, uh, th there's going to be able the, ad the adoption of this. And we're seeing the youth adopting these new technologies mm -hmm. is really, really fast-tracking. So uh, leaders will be the ones that first get it right, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we're seeing a lot of movements about entertainment and travel coming together. Yeah. Microsoft uh, acquiring a, a very large company on entertainment and, and as well bringing travel into it. So we're going to see a lot of that coming to play. And of course, we need to land with the technology that I mentioned into it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, thank you all so much. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. And this, we've only begun to scratch the surface. But I think we've gotten some really compelling insights. And I hope this was helpful and insightful to everyone. Thank you so much to Singapore Tourism Board and Intelligence Squared for putting this together. Thank you to our panelists for being here. And thank you all for being here. And before we close, I'd like to hand it over to Mr. Sridhar, who is Regional Director of India, Middle East, and South Asia for the Singapore Tourism Board, for some closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you to all the esteemed speakers, Nisha, Xavier, Michael. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, it was a very fruitful and engaging discussion, and I'm sure many of our travel industry and media partners today would have found the usefulness of the discussions and helping them to tackle the challenges ahead. I would also like to thank our partner, Intelligence Squared, for making this thought-provoking session possible.